We have a very simple investment strategy. This is what I want to focus on this evening. We try to invest in good companies and only in good companies. We try not to overpay, not to pay too much for their shares when we, when we do that. And then we do the really tricky part of the strategy. This is the difficult bit, nothing. Because we all think that what we are actually paying for is activity. No, we're paying for a result. That's what we want. And if inactivity gets that result, and it does, then that's a good thing. Only invest in good companies. This is the single most important definition from a financial standpoint of a good company. It makes a high return on operating capital employed in cash. For those of you who are not financial analysts, first of all, congratulations, because there are much more important things to do in life than be a financial analyst. Secondly, you might wonder what exactly that means. The, the amount the company produces in each reporting period, its profit, or even better, its cash flow, divided by the capital employed, which is in its balance sheet, is a high number. That's the most important thing to look at when you're looking at companies. Why? Companies are just like us. It's not that complicated. As it says there, if a company makes a return on capital employed, ROC above its cost of capital, then it grows in value steadily over time. If it makes one below its cost of capital, it falls in value over time. Now, the problem with that statement is I've already got into a technical point there, a cost of capital, which may be completely meaningless to most people. Think of it this way. They are just like us. If you borrowed money at, I don't know what very generous rate they're offering at the moment, but let's call it 5%. And you invested in our fund and we compounded in value for you at about 17 or 18% per annum, you would become richer. I hope we can all agree on that. Now, if you borrow from them at 5% and we make you 2% per annum, we're going to make you poorer. Yeah, that's the same with companies. Companies have a cost of capital. People often get very worked up about the fact that it's a, a guess. You have to guess what a company's cost of capital is. You, there are ways of trying to get to it, but it's, it's not something you can prove uh, because it involves a thing called the cost of equity, which don't worry about at all. Start with the assumption it's 10% because that's what I do because we're never going to buy a company because it makes 11%. So we don't need to know exactly. We want companies that are going to shoot the lights out and make much higher returns on their cost of capital. If they do so, like you borrowing money at 5% and making a return of, let's call it 27% in the company, the company will steadily grow in value over time. Don't take my word for it. This is Warren Buffett. I imagine most of you have heard of Warren Buffett, probably the most successful investor since the, uh, the Second World War. And this is what he said in his 1979 annual letter, which he writes to shareholders. He said, the primary test of managerial economic performance, a bit wordy, not how I would have put it, but these are his words, is the achievement of a high earnings rate on equity capital employed. No return on equity capital employed and not the achievement of consistent gains in earnings per share. Now, I always have a, a bet, which I'm prepared to take you all on, on this. If any of you are the recipients of company research and what you do, go tomorrow when you get home tonight and have a look at the last 10 that have come into your inbox, okay? And I will bet you uh, that if any one of the 10 says that they're judging the company primarily on its return on capital employed, just one, I'll give you the 20 euros. If none of them in the 10, you can give me the 20 euros. Now, this is the world's most successful investor uh, saying this. And he said, that he said this, as you can see, 50 years ago. And it's been ignored by the investment industry almost completely since. I mean, what does he know after all? Why, why would you take note of what this man says? This is an illustration of what I mean by this. This is an industry sector, the airline industry. Uh, it's a truly awful sector from an investment standpoint. This is 20 years, so that's 1994 to 2014. I didn't choose them because they suit me. It's pretty typical of the airline industry. I didn't come up with the numbers on this chart. They came from uh, the Airline Industry uh, Trade Association, IATA. And as you can see on this chart, there's their cost of capital, this thing that I mentioned earlier. You can see this red squiggly line. It's a guess. I think if you average that line, it comes out at about 8.5%. Frankly, it doesn't matter in terms of judging whether these are good or bad businesses. So their cost of funds, if you like, is 8.5%. But like them borrowing from this bank at 8.5%. These are their actual returns on capital, these nice gray bars here. And there's the scale over there. You can see it goes up and down a bit. It never once gets to the cost of capital. This is a machine for losing money, basically. If you average those bars, it comes to about 3.5%. This... So it's 8.5% cost, 3.5% return, so they make on average negative 5% returns per annum. If you read the report this is based on, you would see that the airline industry during this period had an average uh, capital employed in the world of about 500 billion US dollars. So they lost 5% of 500 billion dollars for their investors collectively per annum. It's amazing.
And it's a really bad industry. Now, I know when I speak to any audience, there'll be some of you in the audience who will think, maybe even say in the question session, um, well, you can't be right, because if you were right, airlines would cease to exist. Not while you keep sending them money to recapitalize them, they won't. They go bust, they're still flying around. You can go down to the airport and you can go and fly on an American Airlines flight or a Canada flight or a Swiss flight. All of these airlines went bust and were immediately recapitalized shorn of their liabilities. They weren't out of the air for even a nanosecond. Uh, I always say competing in the airline industry must be like the financial equivalent of, of one of those horror movies like Night of the Killer Zombies. Because even if you run your airline pretty well, your competition keeps going bust and then reappearing again without any liabilities. It must be terrifying. It's a really terrible industry. Now, if you have fund managers who are investing in airlines on your behalf, and trust me, you will have a lot of people who are investing in airlines, and you say, Mr. Smith said airlines are a really terrible sector. Why are you invested in them? There are a couple of things that are likely to be said. One would be they won't have a clue what we're talking about. They won't have read Warren Buffett's 1979 annual report. They don't know about a return on capital employed. It's never entered their head. But even if they have got some, some grasp of this, they'll say, ah, you see, I'm pretty smart. They'll say, I buy it when the returns are down there and I sell it when they're up there. And then I buy it back down when they come down here. And then I sell it when it goes up there. And there's only one problem with that. I've never, well, two problems with it. One is I've never actually met anyone who could do that because, you know, you don't know when the returns fall down there, whether that's the bottom. You don't know whether they get up there, whether that's the top. There's no announcement. So, you know, you invariably end up getting your timing a bit wrong. The other thing is this, think back to this return on capital employed versus cost of funds. You buy your airline stock and you say, well, look, it's pretty depressed down here at the moment. There's a recession going on and I think it's all going to bounce back. And I think there'll be some airline consolidation. I think some of them will be taken over and so on. And oh, there'll be a change of management or the oil price is going to drop or all of the above will happen and I'm going to make money, right? Whilst you're sitting waiting for these events to occur, this thing is steadily eroding in value. It's the, it's the investment equivalent of trying to carry around a melting ice cube in your hand in terms of trying to realize your gains. This is what a good company looks like. Um, and you can see, I mean, I've, I've been using these slides for many years. That's why 2014 is the five years. I don't need to change my examples an awful lot in life, I find. Bad sectors and companies are bad. Good ones are good. Doesn't change an awful lot, frankly. This is Unilever, fast moving consumer goods company, which I'm sure you've heard of. This is a decade. It's a very typical decade. There's its cost of capital. You might wonder why the cost of capital is down here on this chart, where it's up there on the other chart. The answer is you've got to have it down there in order to get these bars on the scale, right? This is a company that makes, as you can see, about a 20% return on capital, basically. And its cost of capital, if you average that line, is about the same as the airline industry, allegedly, about 8 or 9%, basically. This makes money and grows in value steadily year by year by year. Now, you can get Unilever wrong. We all get things wrong. I get things wrong. If you buy Unilever when its returns are there in 2008, and it has a really bad 2009 because of the global economy, you probably don't feel too clever about your particular timing of your purchase but how the company grows in value will dig you out. Whereas in the airline, the, how the company shrinks in value will bury you.